Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, The Journey Towards Supply Chain Excellence. So what, and who cares? I'm your host, Allison Crawford. It's the nature of supply chain leaders to be competitive and improve processes. However, it's not always their nature to know how to start and progress on their journey. Often leaders think, so what, who cares, and accept the status quo. Today, we're joined by four thought leaders from across the industry who will discuss the reasons why this should be mission critical and how leaders can start on their journey towards improving performance. Before I hand this over to Laura and the rest of the panel, there are a few things I want to cover with you. First, we're recording today's session and we'll post it to our on-demand webinar page. We can visit this page to, the, to listen to this or any of our other webinars. Additionally, we'll send out the slides to all attendees within 24 hours of the conclusion of the presentation. We encourage you to share these slides with others in your organization, and if you have questions, please reach out to Laura or myself to set up a private discussion. We also want to hear your questions about our findings. You can post to the Q&A or chat function to the left of your screen at any time during the presentation. We've left time at the end of the webinar to address all of your questions and comments. And finally, we will be live tweeting the webinar. So if you'd like to join the social media conversation, you can use the hashtag SCIWebinar and the handle at SCI Insights LLC during the event. Now, let me introduce your panel. First up is Cindy Hain, Vice President of Product Management at Alemica. Cindy is a 20-year global supply chain executive with a background in technology product management and implementation in the areas of global logistics, supply chain optimization, transportation management, and warehousing and distribution solution design. She has held leadership positions at global logistics companies BAX Global, DB Schenker, and Americold, managing large-scale products. At Alemica, she has participated in technology design, development, and implementations for global companies in the process industries. Cindy is responsible for Alemica's supply chain operating network for logistics, including solutions for transportation execution and visibility, freight cost management, time slot management, and terminal warehouse visibility. Next, let me introduce Joe Krakowska. Joe started his career with the Dow Chemical Company in 1983 in the Research Assignments Program. He spent 17 years in Midland, Michigan in various assignments in research and development, technical sales and development, capital projects and manufacturing. He was named site leader for Kings Lynn, England, and business manufacturing leader for fungicides with manufacturing sites in France, Brazil, South Africa, Colombia, and China. In 2007, Joe moved to Indianapolis with global responsibility for formulations and packaging operations, fumigants, and external manufacturing activity. In 2009, he moved to his current role as supply chain director for Dow AgriSciences. Joining us from Cummins Engine is Erica Mariga. Erica joined Cummins in 2013 as part of the corporate supply chain strategy team. She is responsible for leading supply chain design and network operations I'm sorry, optimization efforts for Cummins. She has a PhD in industrial engineering from Arizona State University and later joined Tecnologico de Monterrey Campus Sinaloa as a professor of industrial engineering. She was also part of TIS Consulting in Mexico where she led supply chain design and network optimization for governmental projects. And finally, your host, Laura Ciceri, founder of Supply Chain Insights. As an enterprise strategist, Laura focuses on the changing face of enterprise technologies. Her research is designed for the early adopter seeking first mover advantage, and she comes to the stage with over 40 years of diverse supply chain experience. So Laura, I know all of these folks attended our global summit and experienced firsthand the discussions we were having about pursuing supply chain excellence, and I'm sure our audience would love to hear their thoughts, so let me turn this over to you to get started. Well, awesome. Thank you, Allison, and thanks for joining us today. We have over 90 people online, and again, we will be sharing the recording with everyone. It is our goal for open content to share the research freely. And I love having this panel because each of them have such unique perspectives. Erica, let's start out. How does Cummins define supply chain in terms of the organization? Just give the group a little bit of an orientation. Yes, well, thank you, Laura, for the invite. Uh, you know, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, for coming, um, the supply chain is quite, um, quite a large organization. Um, we have, uh, just so you can you know, uh, imagine, we have overall income and we have more than 55,000 employees in 193 different countries. And just for professional employees within the supply chain organization, we have more than 5,000. 
So it is almost 10%, and we're just speaking about the professional employees. Our supply chain organization goes all uh, the way from uh, procurement activities, uh, manufacturing. Uh, we have you know, our own strategy team. Uh, we're housing logistics. Trade and compliance is within um, supply chain. And um, we have some obviously supporting groups, such as legal, um, legal communications. But the core of the of the function leading you know leading uh, transformation is the strategy team and the business enterprise transformation team, which is leading basically our ERP implementation. So that's that's how wide the functions are. Um, Great. And, you know, I'm still. You know, amazed sometimes that people think supply chain is just procurement, but it's way, way more than that. At least it is in Cummins. Well, and traditionally in discrete industries like Cummins, it's been procurement. And Joe, in the mm -hmm. process industries, it's often manufacturing. So, Joe, tell the group a little bit about Dow AgriSciences. And I know you're in the middle of some merger activity, but how do you define supply chain today? Yeah, you know, internally when we talk about this. I often uh, do a little survey in the group to, to ask the audience, even within our own company, what do they define as supply chain? And in that conversation, we talk about uh, three pieces. We talk about the operational piece. I'll call that logistics. Uh, that, that's everything from site logistics to warehouse deployment, et cetera. Um, the second piece is planning. The third piece is design and launch. And then you can really even think of an umbrella over those three pieces around improvement and innovation uh, because we do have an expertise center that is uh, specifically designed and, and created to make sure that we never stop with just optimizing what we currently have. We're always stretching that with tools, technology, organization design uh, to try and get more out of the system. So, uh, so that's what I would say, uh, uh, Laura, is the operations piece, the planning piece, design and launch. And how many people, roughly, Joe, are in the supply chain organization at Dow Erica Sciences? I, so we've got, uh, you know, a total population. Uh, if you look at, you know, revenue, it's about a $7 billion company, around, you know, seven 000, eight thousand 8,000 employees total. Um, and, uh, and within supply chain proper, so now we're talking about an org chart, which is often a, a bit arbitrary, but in the 200 to 300 range. Okay, great. And Cindy, you work with a lot of companies. How many companies does Alemica actually service or serve? Yes, and um, thanks, Laura. Thanks for having me here today. So we are a supply chain operating network for the process industries, and we have about 10,000 trading partners on our network today. And those are all trading partners that either provide products or services to companies in the process manufacturing space. So if you're buying from or selling to a process manufacturing organization, um, including logistics services, you, you should be on our network. <laughs> okay. And the reason why I wanted to have each of the panelists give a little background, we say the term supply chain like it's one common definition, but you can hear from the three panelists it's a different perspective. And part of our webinar series is we want to have the research that we do be a backdrop for people to have a conversation. And it's always good to know a little bit about the background of the people. And one of the things that we did for our research this summer was we actually looked at balance sheet information for the period of time of 2009 to 2015 to really understand which companies were outperforming, driving improvement, and outperforming their peers. And the analysis for the supply chains to admire work, which we published in July, was to evaluate this data for 2006 to 2015 and 2009 to 2015 to first look at improvement. So was the group driving improvement at the intersection of operating margin and inventory turns faster than the peer group? We looked at the relative position of the peers to price to tangible book. 
is we're really trying to help the supply chain leader understand what is value. And the traditional supply chain organization is very focused on the cost agenda, and we wanted to drive it to a value-based agenda. So we did some correlations for the event on price to tangible book. And our thought was that market capitalization has a lot of uh, volatility due to changing economic conditions, and price to book includes intangibles, which lacks a consistent accounting across companies to account for things like patents and goodwill. But we felt like the supply chain leader could affect price to tangible book. And then we also wanted to find out which companies were performing against the performance factors to a higher level. And the concept here is that the supply chain leader manages a balanced portfolio, and the supply chain is a complex system. So we wanted to see which companies were driving a level of performance in the area of growth, operating margin, inventory turns, and return on invested capital. Because we believe from our research that this is a nonlinear complex system where the relationships between growth, profitability, the cycles, which we're using inventory as our measurement, and complexity have a very tight connection, but these are very nonlinear. Now, when we did the analysis of 320 companies across industries, we broke the companies into industry-specific peer groups. So, for example, we compared Dow to process chemical companies. We compared Procter & Gamble to household package goods companies. We compared Cummins Engine to heavy equipment companies. So we divided it into peer groups based upon NACS codes. Now, the companies that won at the top level, so they were driving improvement faster than the peers, they had above average price to tangible book than their peers for the period of 2009 to 2015, and they were driving the balanced portfolio to a higher degree than their peers, is the group shown here. And these are our supply chains to admire winners. And I'm very pleased to have Cummins on the phone today with Erica. Cummins is a winner. Cummins has actually been a winner for the last two years. We also had Edwards Life Sciences, Steelcase, TMSC, Taiwan Semiconductor, Cisco Systems, Cooper Tires, and Apple. Now, on our retail area, so we grouped retail and apparel together, we had Carter's, CVS, Dollar Tree, Walmart, Target, and Whole Foods. And on the process side, we had L'Oreal, the Clorox company, and BASF. And at our event, we had presentations from Clorox, BASF, and Cummins. And then that was our first group. Those are the winners. They are driving improvement better than their peer group, a higher level of value as measured by price to tangible book, and their performance factors, all of the performance factors for the winners are above average for that peer group. However, we also saw in the numbers that we would have a company that was driving improvement, was a higher level of price to tangible book, but might have been slightly off on one of the performance factors. So maybe they were like a half a percentage point off on the inventory cycles or on the profitability. So they were a little bit off on one of the performance factors and we called them finalists. And this represents 12% of the industry of winners and finalists. So when we add the finalists to the portfolio, we add in the companies like Statel and the lubricants division, SD Lauder and Beauty, Hershey, which is the only company that qualified for food and beverage, Coca-Cola for beverage, uh, Beck and Dickinson, Coloplast, and Medtronic for medical device, Caterpillar and United Tractors, Intel, Celestica, Qualcomm, EMC, and VTech. And then when we come up to the restaurant and apparel area, we add Chipotle, Lowe's, VF, Under Armour's, PVH, TH, TJX, and Lululemon. Now, this is 12% of the companies that we actually profiled. 
What we found was that 88% of companies were not driving improvement and were not driving performance to a higher level than the peer group or not driving price to tangible book. So let's just kind of weigh in here with the panel. What did you think of the methodology and the presentations and the discussions about supply chain excellence? Erica, let's go with you first. And thank you for being a presenter at the summit. Oh, no, thank you, Nora. Um, so, uh, our, you know, when discussing with our group, and by our group I mean corporate supply chain strategy over in Cummins, uh, when you reached out to us and we had a discussion with you, we went over your methodology. And I must say that um, as a group, um, we, and being, and I mentioned that during the summit, we are an engineering company and we approach everything that we do as an engineering process. So we are always very excited when we have methodologies that are data driven, that are, um, they might be complex, but um, they make sense. And things that we feel we can uh, somehow do things that we can influence the outcome on. Um, so we like that, as you mentioned before, it is not a beauty contest. Um, it is uh, an understandable methodology with clear correlation. So we, we appreciate that. Well, thank you very much. And why do you think Cummins won the award? Any thoughts there? Because I know you went back and had mm -hmm. a lot of discussions with the mm -hmm. people that you work with. Why do you think Cummins was able to drive a higher level of improvement, higher mm -hmm. level of performance, and price to tangible book? Yeah. Um, well, I do believe it's all rooted into um, our supply chain transformation journey. Um, it is a long-term uh, roadmap for us. It's almost uh, from now till you know, from now till the end. It is to be mapped for six years, um, and it's been uh, going on for up, I don't know, probably three three years. Uh, but it has clear understanding of what is it that we need to do, clear SNOP processes. Um, and to end disability strategies and, and programs. Uh, but most importantly is uh, the, the roots in the company for innovation, for meeting our customers' expectations, being a customer-driven company. And that has led us to use one of our core values, which is sustainability, um, as, a, as a value creation um, tool. Awesome. Now, Cindy, I know as a technologist, you know, we often will go into companies and we'll say buy our technology and we'll drive higher levels of improvement and performance, but that hasn't been the case so much. What do you think about the methodology and what do you think you can learn as a technologist contributing to the market? Yeah, yeah, great question. So, you know, one of the things I noted, it wasn't in this particular slide, but part of your research there was a, uh, some research that if you, if you didn't make the cut, if you, if you weren't in that top tier, you're most likely struggling with access to data, which drives a lack of supply chain visibility, and then several organizational changes, be it alignment within your organization or mind share of your executives. And so if you contrast that with the speakers from all of your winners, you mentioned the BASF, the Clorox Company, and Cummins, one of the things that I wrote down at the conference that was kind of common uh, across all of them was they had built an environment of trust and collaboration. And so, yes, yeah, so from a technology standpoint, we've, we can continue to reduce the cost of automation and digitizing supply chain, but I think there was this common theme that we heard in the, at the conference, which is at the end of the day, people will delay a fully autonomous supply chain. So building that trust and collaboration uh, among your team internally as well as within your trading partners is really, you know, one of the key action items that, that I took away from the conference is, to, is you know, really makes uh, a, one of these initiatives successful. Yeah, I sat back and I kept hearing the same themes. Joe, now you actually helped us in the development of the methodology. When you look at the methodology and you think about it, what did you learn about the methodology about excellence and what did you hear from the speakers? 
Well, I, I, you know, maybe this is going to be a bit of an echo with some of the prior comments, but I, I just want to underline uh, three, three things. One is this data-driven nature. Uh, we, we joke a little bit and say it's not a beauty contest, but um, uh, that's well grounded with the data and, and the methodology, which brings up point number two. It's reproducible in any hands. It, the um, the <laughs> assessment is not subject to who happens to be looking at the data. It, it's about the data. And the third thing is that, um, and this was, I think, of particular importance to me because uh, in the broader DAO, we are very functionally organized. And in any function, you exist to become excellent at those functional expectations. And in doing so, sometimes you lose sight of the business. And the, uh, the, the methodology here, I think, is business-driven, not functionally driven. So you don't see a lot of uh, narrow functional metrics. Uh, the question to how well is your supply chain performing is synonymous with how well is your business performing. So those would be the three things that I highlight. Well, great. And you know, one of the things that we learned in doing the analysis, and you know, I always step back and say, okay, this, what's the so what? Who cares? And one of the things that I learned is that it is much easier to be driving improvement and performance when growth is increasing. But when growth is in decline, the balance is tougher and the portfolio starts to fall apart. Uh, people will look at functional metrics and they have a hard time driving balance. Of the 12% for the winners and finalists, only one was actually able to power through a growth decline. So people that are driving upwards in growth have a much easier job with alignment and the ability to get to data. The other thing I found very interesting was that the process industries and in the years that we've done this, and process includes oil and gas, includes chemical, industrial chemical, uh, food, beverage, household products, tobacco. Uh, on these process industries, we're finding that as a group, they are declining. Retail is actually growing, uh, meaning that they're driving higher levels of improvement. They're able to outperform. We're seeing more leadership there. But the process companies are starting to fall off, right? So last year we saw General Mills. We saw InBev. We saw Colgate. We're seeing these companies unable to drive the levels of improvement and performance against the peer group. And I liken it to a frog in a beaker of hot water. If you think about the frog in the beaker of hot water, as you turn up the heat, the frog has the choice to either jump out of the beaker or to stay in, and ultimately the poor frog is cooked by the hot water. What has happened in the process industries is companies have tried to power growth is they have increased complexity, and they've not redesigned the supply chain for the increased complexity. And it's been slow in the process industries. You know, it's been 38% new product items a year. Whereas when you look at the discrete industries where we have 50 to 80% new products and we've got major shifts in product portfolio and price, those discrete industries had to get really good at planning, really good at form and function of inventory, move out of the functions into balanced portfolios, and they had to get very active on network design. So that had to be a step change for them, for them to survive, whereas the process industries have been unable to adapt to the level of complexity. The process industries are actually sliding backwards. Retail is moving forward. Discrete industries are holding their own. And that was a very interesting thing for me to go through in the analysis. You know, a company like Colgate, which has 30% better return on invested capital than the company like Procter & Gamble, is actually at the same point in 2015 that they were in 2006 on inventory turns and operating margin. And so while we talk about driving supply chain improvement and we talk about improving cost and inventory turns, 
88% of companies are struggling, and the process industry is struggling the greatest when we look at the breakouts of the companies. Now, the other thing we wanted to understand is what is value. And most companies have been on a very cost-driven agenda, and that's very limiting because as we get into cost to value, people will ask, well, how do you define value? And there's not a good answer in the industry about value. So the first years that we did this, we looked at price and we looked at market capitalization. And this year we looked at price to tangible book and we actually asked the attendees at the conference to give us their views of what they felt would actually drive the highest price to tangible book improvement. And the attendees said clear business strategy, SNOP effectiveness, and then you can see alignment, agility, and ability to use data and visibility of the supply chain is in the middle. And then at the bottom, you see effectiveness of the supply chain center of excellence, supply or reliability, globalization, and the ability of IT to meet line of business goals. And when you think about it, many times we're trying to improve Improve value through IT. And, you know, it's pretty clear that the leaders feel that we're not able to drive value through IT projects, even though that continues to be what we're focused on. Now, we took 65 factors from our research of 6,000 respondents, and we tried to do correlations of price to tangible book. We looked at things like you know, which technology companies chose, how were companies organized, uh, did the company have, you know, a single instance of ERP, did they have, um, uh, you know, this or that, and so 65 different factors. And when we were able to finish the correlations, we found that four factors actually had the highest correlation. One was if the company believed they had an effective center of excellence, that had a very high correlation. Then it was SNOP effectiveness, followed by second and third tier visibility of suppliers, which I think that really this is a proxy for higher levels of visibility in the extended supply chain. And also, if they had less pain with supplier reliability. Of the 65 factors that we tried to correlate, four had the highest correlation of price to tangible book. Now, it's interesting because if you think back to what do supply chain leaders believe had the highest correlation, you can see that people felt that clear business strategy would have a high correlation, but it was actually the supply chain center of excellence. And so as we talk to people, what we find is that often people will have a clear business strategy, but it won't be connected to action. And that if there's an effective supply chain center of excellence, Along with that, there's a very clear definition of what is supply chain excellence. And that's really hard because every company defines supply chain differently and many companies don't take the time to define excellence. And, you know, they think, well, everybody knows what excellence is, but no, as it needs to be really clear to really make it actionable. And then the other thing is supplier reliability. If we think about, you know, on time, from suppliers, or we think about quality of conformance from suppliers, or we think about risk mitigation, supplier viability is increasing as a risk, and supplier issues are increasing. But I think many people don't think about that, particularly in the discrete industries where we're dealing with mm -hmm. new product innovation and how we're working with suppliers. And so sales and operations planning was the one that uh, the supply chain leaders actually got right. So what do you guys think? You know, is there time to take a different path, or what do you think about what we learned and what drives value? Cindy, your thoughts? Yeah, well, one of the things that you just mentioned I, I thought, thought was particularly noteworthy, which is basically you don't need a single ERP solution to create superior supply chain visibility. So because that didn't, a single ERP instance didn't correlate to, uh, to a supply chain to admire. So, I mean, that was one of the things that jumped out at me. Definitely, you can create supply chain uh, visibility not in your ERP. And I'm, I'm actually fond of saying that 
your supply chain exists beyond your firewall, so too should the solutions you use to manage it. And visibility is a, is a great example. If you have all of your trading partners looking at the same data on one single business platform, business network platform, that's a, a great way to start gaining that visibility. Joe, how about your thoughts? What did you learn? Yeah, I, when I think of the, the entire conference, I have these mental snapshots and, and actually some physical snapshots of screens. And the, the bar chart that you showed on what we believe drove uh, value improvement and what actually drove it happens to be one of my favorite slides of the week. So um, this was impactful for me. It, it, it said that, uh, yeah, there are many things that are important, but the intuition around clear business strategy was less important than the other things that you noticed. Um, and, and supply chain visibility, center of expertise, uh, great SNOP, those resonated. And, and um, I, I would say, you know, if you're out there saying, w what is it that uh, I need to do to make sure I'm running an effective business, I think those four things from your bar chart are a great place to start the thinking. And I, for me, I love the idea that we have this center of expertise and innovation as a piece of that. Uh, that, too, is, I think, important. In supply chain, I don't know if we think of it directly as a form of R&D, but, but in fact, when you think of business processes, business models, the role that supply chain plays, I do think that we are explicitly engaged in R&D. We just don't call it that. And so we need to run these small experiments and, and test ideas, uh, and we do that continuously, and that's how we build better businesses. So um, one of my favorite slides, Laura. Thank you. Okay. Erica, how about your thoughts? Um, well, uh, I'm going to second um, what was just said, and those, those items with the highest correlation uh, – are some of you know are probably some of the items that we have as part of our our transformation journey as part of our initiative team there. So um, if you for those of you who attended the summit via in person or, or through the webcast, I talked about uh, one of coming challenges, which was end-to-end -end data visibility. Um, we are it's something we're looking you know looking into and working towards and. When you show that slide during the summit, and once again, it's just a validation of that. You know that what we're doing is, um, you know, it's in the right path. Um, so that's something I like. And the other one uh, is just that understanding again and validation that we don't need to be in a single ERP solution in order to have that that visibility. It's something um, you know I've taken back back home and in meditate about. Yeah, I think we've been very quick to invest in ERP for the sake of ERP, but you know, when we look forward uh, and we think about the adoption of new technologies, because we ask companies to lean forward and think about supply chain 2030, one of the interesting things that I found was that you know, we're losing the innovators. Um, you know, when I did this analysis in 2006, I had a normal distribution where I had an equal number of early adopters and an equal number of late adopters. And now we have two to three late adopters to every early adopter. And I think about all the new forms of analytics, you know, whether it's cognitive learning, rules-based ontologies, Hadoop, Apache Spark, all of the great technologies, robotics, uh, digital manufacturing that are coming about that really require a lot of testing and learning and innovation and outside in process development. And uh, then I contrast it with the fact that we're becoming far more conservative as a set of supply chain technologists in adopting new technologies. And, you know, the new technologies are coming from new companies that we may not even know the names of or may not even be able to have the conversation with, but are so exciting. And, you know, I think it's an interesting irony that I've never seen technology change and be so exciting as it is now, but yet we're becoming so conservative. And when we ask people to think about 2030, 
and to think about the evolution, it's really about a confluence of technologies. It isn't about one technology by itself. It's about these new forms of analytics, and it's about the development of streaming architecture for machine-to-machine interface or sensor interface or telematics or GPS data to be able to bring streaming data or data that's real-time into the organization and also to look at 3D printing or other means of manufacturing. We actually had a presentation about uh, biomolecular reengineering of yeast and fermentation and feeding yeast waste streams at the conference and robotics uh, and how we actually will move towards these. And when we talked about analytics, you know, 75% of the analytics forms that we're going to be seeing that people thought were the most significant for 2030 are really around new types of technologies. It's about cognitive reasoning um, and changing decision support. So, you know, in 2030, I think the planning systems that we have today will look back and we'll say they're obsolete. It's about mining unstructured text for sentiment analysis, whether it's warranty or social data, so that we can get true customer sentiment into the supply chain quickly. And it's about the Internet of Things to be able to look at streaming data and using memory far more effectively so I found it very interesting that most of the analytics and many of the techniques that we're going to be talking about are really causing us to have to rethink technology. And when we talked about talent, you know, one of the things that we see is that while we have employee turnover and we have talent being pulled in many ways and we have retirement, that our top challenge is these challenging skill requirements. And so, Joe, I just want to kind of step back and think, what do you think of this section in 2030, and what do you think our biggest opportunity is for these changing skill requirements? Yeah, I, so I'll share a quick story. I was, I was at a university at a supply chain conference, and one of the uh, uh, professors there was a 20-year veteran from industry, happened to be a mechanical engineer, and I was in the process of uh, trying to formulate my own thinking on your question, how do you strategically design talent in a supply chain organization? And being an engineer myself, I thought I, asked, I would ask this 20-year in industry veteran uh, his views on this strategic question on how to structure a workforce. And, and I gave him two ch choices. You know, do you, we're a technology company. Do you take engineers from your company and then allow them to become supply chain professionals and make a career out of it? Or do you go to business schools, for example, and, and recruit business school majors who specialize in supply chain? Um, and he, without even thinking, immediately went to the business majors, and we went on with a conversation on why he believed that to be uh, a, a better answer. And fundamentally, he was pointing to um, this amorphous uh, dynamic space we call business. And, and his, bu his punchline was that engineers look for the right answer, and business majors look for any right answer that works for that moment, and they're comfortable changing it tomorrow. And he differentiated that as a pivot point for talent selection and talent strategy. That one really stuck with me, and I think it flanges with your question. I, I think in the end we need both. Uh, in my organization we talk about 40-40-20, where 40% uh, is going to be the, the business supply chain major. 40% are going to be engineers, technical majors from within the company. Uh, and then 20% are going to be passed through from everything from finance and economics to uh, HR. Um, and, and so I think you need this mix of, I'll call it the millennial perspective with the sage experience. You need a mix of university background, you need a mix of experience, and, and you have to have that magic ingredient of innovation, that expertise center. And I think when you put that stew together, you get good stuff. 
Erica, your thoughts uh, about the discussion about Supply Chain 2030 and what are top challenges for talent? Sure. Um, well, um, I think you know. I think talent will you know will always be an issue. Um, the way we try to approach uh, you know talent management and talent acquisition is coming past traditionally hire to develop professionals. Most of the time, um, we hire recent graduates, either at the bachelor's level or master's level, and we bring them in, bring them into rotation programs within the company, um, and um, we, they, you know, they go on and become leaders. So far, um, it's been a successful program. I foresee the company will continue doing, you know, doing this. However, I must say is that we, the challenge exists in building those, you know, those job profiles within the company to match the needs of match the needs of the company. So we hire pretty well against those job profiles, but those job profiles need to be updated continuously, and uh, that's something we we are also working on. And I think that might be, you know, one of those. You know, our biggest challenge is making sure we are, you know, we are updating um, those needs, the company's needs. Cindy, how about your thoughts? You know, as you set through 2030 and the discussions and think about changing skill requirements, thoughts here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as a technology provider, we are constantly looking at ways to create solutions that people want to use. and. So certainly one of our areas is to increase the level of automation and, create, and increase the access to data. So creating, uh, you know, from manual data entry to a knowledge worker, and so that's a work itself is far more engaging for the user. And I think the other things we're looking at are you know, to increase the amount of mobile applications that we have to reflect the workforce that, that, um, that's going to be entering the market as well as adding social aspects to the solution and, and improving the way that workers can collaborate across the supply chain so that they, they see, an, they see a, a solution and kind of get used to using a solution that looks similar to what they're used to using in their personal lives. So we've been, even looked in some cases at some gamification aspects. So, so yeah, so to us as a technology provider, we're looking to create solutions that will really engage workers and, and by, uh, by default, hopefully, interest more and more people into the supply chain workforce. Well, great. You know, part of the conference is designed for networking, right? So we divide people up on tables. We try to create a networking environment for people to really talk to each other. Joe, when you think back to all the networking, what were some of your top thoughts as you shared and talked and explored with others? Um, I guess my top thought, Laura, was how productive or effective it was. Uh, I, I think the, the design of the conference was not a selling environment. It was a learning environment. And uh, in each of the conversations that I had with, with uh, companies or resources, uh, it, it, was, it was a thought exploration and, and a fit exploration. So w without naming specific people or, or companies, I would tell you that uh, three very tangible learning points came out of my discussions that I, you know, I'm bringing back to the office and have meetings this week to to talk about how to uh, engage those back home here. So, um, yeah, I, to me, it was it was uh, about effectiveness and learning. Erica, um, I think you know your company has you and your company have defined the conference in such a way that it leads to uh, insightful discussion. Uh, it doesn't seem a competition among companies on who, who's doing, you know, things best, but it is a thought-provoking um, and 
sharing sharing environment that I appreciated um, a lot. Cindy, any insights? Yeah, I can echo those thoughts as well. I really did appreciate the the networking, kind of the brainstorming part of the agenda. So we were able to really talk to talk to different groups of people and come up with different uh, thoughts about what we had just heard. And and I think I mentioned, you know, I left your conference feeling slightly uncomfortable with uh, some of the innovative topics and really trying to yearn to yearning to come up with a path forward for for my own company as well as those of my customers. So very in, insightful, very thought provoking and uh, and some very interesting networking opportunities. So I'm looking forward to participating again. Well let's get to some questions. So Joe, I know you've been doing some data visualization work and Erica and Cindy, I know you've been working on it with mm -hmm. Alemica. Question from Richard is, you know, if we think about data visualization what kind of team is required to implement uh, data visualization tools? I know you guys have been working on this. Anybody want to jump in? Yeah, th this is Joe. So oh. I, uh, I'm thinking of a couple of different examples. Um, I, and Laura, I don't know if it's okay to, to mention products by name, but uh, Tableau and Canaxis are two that come to mind for me. And the team that was used, y you know, it starts with kind of a burning problem. Statement, uh, you know, in the case of Canaxis, we struggled with taking all of our uh, finished product SKUs and figuring out how to model that dynamic space based on a five-year forecast. And w what we struggled with is, you know, the time it took to do that. By the time you finished some kind of a view, it was ready for next year's refresh of the data, and and you were obsolete. And, and this is a case where, uh, you know, you go out and you scour the landscape for possibilities using that expertise center uh, that we talk about so often. And a few people go out, they, they experiment, they learn a little, then you decide to take the, the plunge, you pilot something, um, and, and then, you know, you, you hit your target. And um, when, it, when it hits, uh, it, it really is a celebration kind of a feel. It, it, I use the term R&D, and whenever you discover something, there's excitement that goes with that. So to me, the ingredients are a very specific problem that, or opportunity that you're trying to chase, a couple of people who uh, have the time and the passion to go experiment and explore, uh, and then an organization that is change ready so that when you have the new thing uh, available for its first full-scale pilot, you've got an audience out there that is thirsty for trying new things and, and you know, living and enjoying a dynamic environment. But Joe, implicit to what I hear is it's not an IT group and it's not a project and it's not something that, um, you know, you've got an as-is or a to-be. It sounds like it's something that was kind of a uh, evolution, uh, and it was a business diverse team. Is that fair? Oh, very fair. And, and thanks for asking it explicitly. Uh, you know, we, I, I don't look at anything as an IT project. I, I look at every one of these as a, a business opportunity or a business project. And, and then, yes, IT is inevitably involved in that, but no more or no less than finance or engineering or, you know, it depends on the project. But, yeah, I, I struggle to understand what it even means when we say IT project. I think uh, one of my uh, uh, points of humor for the week was somebody on stage said, there's no such thing as a successful IT project because if you're running it like that, you, you, you usually never finish it and you never get business value. I can't remember who said it, but I, I, I laughed because, yeah, I think it's true. If you run it as an IT project, it's probably not going to give you the business value that you were hoping for. Erica or Cindy, any comments on data visualization and what's required on the team? Yep, yeah, I was going to point out. Go ahead. Go ahead, Erica. Cindy went. Oh, thank you. Yep, this is Erica. So in our case, um, we do have, you know, some groups that are centers of excellence for, um, in the case of data visualization, uh, for, you know, again, 
uh, Tableau and uh, MSBI tools, self-service BI tools. Moreover, in our specific team, the way we've approached this is we have part of our team are the, you know, they're very specific um, people who are strategists. Uh, we have some of us who are into supply chain analytics, network optimization, inventory optimization, and we have a couple of uh, members of the team who are uh, recent graduates that are very proficient in, um, in data visualization, data management. So the way we do this is for these uh, young professionals, we pair them with the strategists and we pair them with us. So they learn about the business and they help us develop those um, data visualization templates and tools that the team can use over and over. So just like Joe said, we don't approach this as an IT project, but it's just uh, the way the team has been structured to succeed in this. Cindy, your thoughts? Thank you, Erica. Yeah, just just real quickly, so we've embedded data, a self-serve data visualization solution in our, in our solution network. And uh, just to, to echo what Joe and Erica are saying, it, it ends up being the, the business folks, the operators, who are really needing to try to create a management by exception solution and, and would prefer to look at a dashboard as opposed to receiving several email alerts. So, so it's um, it's a it's a self serve solution. It's embedded in our solution, and, and the people who understand the data are the ones who are are tapping into it and creating the the system that they want to be able to manage by exception. Okay. Um, there is a question about price to book, and uh, it's actually price to tangible book. So book uh, includes tangibles and intangibles. And uh, it's uh, a question about how does it compare to operating profit after capital charge. And uh, they're very different ratios. Uh, you've got to look at the formulas. Uh, but uh, price to tangible book looks at market price of the stock divided by tangible book value. And offer operating profit is after capital charge actually takes away the capital uh, charge from the profit. So they're very different uh, ratios. Um, we're trying to look at how do we build value in public markets. Okay, well let's wrap up. So um, we're going to do this again in 2017. Uh, we're going to do it at the same time. We're actually looking at the right location. Um, you know, let's just reflect. If you had one word or one sentence for people listening, piece of advice, Joe, what would it be? What did you learn? For me, it was new business models enabled through channel digitization. How much fun will that be, hey? <laughs> and uh, Erica? A, a, an amazing amount of fun, yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I think one of the opportunities there, Joe, is that many times people think about supply chain as a cost base, right? But I think supply chains to enable new business models and growth is a fabulous discussion. So, Erica, your thoughts? One word of advice? Well, continue disrupting our status quo even if you're leading the market. And that's hard, isn't it? I mean, you know, when people are leaders, they get kind of complacent, right? I think about food and beverage and when people lost faith in packaged food, right? It was mm -hmm. hard for food and beverage to disrupt or, you know, Eastman Kodak that had the patents on the digital camera and couldn't disrupt itself. That's a hard thing, uh, but I agree with you. Cindy? Yes, mine would be digitize your supply chain. And so using a combination of the evolution of the technologies, traditional technologies, as well as the revolutionary technologies that we talked about. And those are eventually going to merge in the middle that you'll be able to really achieve uh, much you know, success if you continue to digitize your supply chain. And digitization of the supply chain means different things to different people as well. So uh, one of the things that we explored was what does that mean? And I encourage people to push for those definitions. So basically, we want to encourage people to come and join us uh, September 5th through the 8th in 2017, where we can turn you 
continue the journey to imagine the supply chain. This is the Supply Chain Insights team. Uh, we always love seeing clients. And until then, we will be sharing the research openly on our website, in our community, Beat Fusion, on LinkedIn, and we're creating a special page on Supply Chain 2030 and through Twitter uh, so that you can join us. And each month we will be doing a quantitative study. We're currently doing a customer-centric supply chain study. We try to be very careful in our panel groups. So if you take this study, we will share the results with you. You'll have the opportunity to join a roundtable to actually collaborate with people like we've got on the phone to explore this further and to be able to get answers. One of the things we find is that often people will say customer-centric, but we don't really have a good definition. And we'll continue to build this momentum for next year's summit for 2017. And until then, this is where you can find the research that I write and uh, the team writes. I just want to wrap up and thank Erica and Joe and Cindy for joining us today and thank the group that uh, joined us with the webinar. We will be posting this on SlideShare within the next couple of days and all of the presentations that we're allowed to post are available on both uh, our website on the Global Summit as well as on our uh, community. Allison, I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thanks, Laura. And she's mentioned most of what I'm going to do to wrap up. So again, we want to thank everyone for attending today as well as our speakers. Um, I have put it back to the slide with all of our social media information. So I do encourage you to work with us on our LinkedIn company page, our Twitter handle, um, as well as our website. We have lots of information coming out with our research and things that we're working on. So stay tuned to that. Um, as Laura mentioned, we are going to be sending out the slides in an email to you all uh, within 24 hours, so keep an eye on that. If it goes to your spam folder, uh, if you don't get it by tomorrow, say 3 o'clock, um, look in your spam folder. If you still don't get it, please reach out to me directly and I will make sure that you have that. <coughs> Excuse me. And again, if you have any specific questions or follow-up conversations you'd like to have with Laura, please feel free to reach out to either one of us and we'd be happy to help you with your supply chain strategy. So thanks again everyone and we will see you next month hopefully on our webinar on Demand Driven. So have a great afternoon and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks.